computing across the curriculum. This is such an interesting area. Back in the old days, before we had this fabulous new computing curriculum, when we were teaching ICT, there was a lot of us interested in ICT across the curriculum. Of course, embedding all of these tools and many, many more as ways to enhance, extend, enrich learning in all of the subjects which students study. And there was even a movement to say we didn't need to teach ICT. We could, be, we could embed these so very effectively across the curriculum that our students would learn all they needed to do about blogging, about spreadsheets, about digital devices through the medium of other subjects. I'm far from convinced that that was effective back then, and I certainly don't think it would be effective now. Nevertheless, these tools and many, many others are really very interesting, effective ways of extending learning in all subject areas. And I do hope that that is still happening, that the move from ICT to computing doesn't mean that ch children are still aren't making use of video across the curriculum, aren't using spreadsheets to analyse data in maths or science lessons or whatever, that we've not thrown out that particular baby with the bathwater of old ICT. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. The new computing curriculum, as you all know, starts with this really inspiring ambition. A high-quality computing education equips pupils to use computational thinking and creativity. Anybody remember how the sentence goes on? To, to understand and to change the world. Let's not just stop at that bit. Of course we want them to have computational thinking. Of course we want them to be creative. But let's remember there's a purpose to this. And the purpose to this is, as it says, and as you remember, understanding and changing the world. Assessing how effectively computing is going in schools is simply a matter of going up to children and asking them, have you understood the world? Have you changed the world? If we get a tick in both boxes, we're doing a good job there. Does anybody know what the next sentence is? other than Simon, who wrote this. <laughs> okay. The next sentence is really very, very inspiring, too. Computing has deep links with mathematics, with science, with design and technology, and I'd say other subjects. In fact, I think I did say other subjects, but that's another matter. It provides insights into both natural and artificial systems. It's written there in the statutory programme study. It must be true. How much are we doing this? in our lessons? Are we willing to just stop at the computational thinking and creativity bit and forget about the way that this subject gives us insights into these really interesting and exciting domains? David Brown, who's just stepped down as national lead for computing and e-safety for our friends at Ofsted. Let's hear it for Ofsted. <laughs> <laughs> um, the fourth, when he was allowed to present on what he was looking for when inspecting computing education. Said a school's curriculum is good or better if there are links with other subjects in the school that are productive and those strengthen pupils' learning in computing. If that's not happening in your school, then David would have regarded your curriculum as one which requires improvement. I think he might have been right. We have, of course, for Barefoot, and it's been lovely to have Barefoot here and hearing so much about how Barefoot has worked out in schools this lovely model of computational thinking, thanks, Julia, which separates the ideas or, or combines the ideas of these concepts of things like logic, algorithms, decomposition, pattern, abstraction, evaluation, with a number of approaches, tinkering, creating, de debugging, persevering, and collaborating. Of course, we all know that these things don't just make sense in the domain of computing. These are things which can be applied across the curriculum. Heaven forbid we're just doing logical reasoning in our computing lessons. Heaven forbid the only place where a child evaluates the work which they or their peers do is in a computing lesson. These are things which have very wide applications. And we, we often focus, of course, rightly, I think, on the concepts. But let's not forget the approaches. And it's been great hearing about the importance of resilience and the transfer of debugging from the language of code to English and to maths work and so on. So it's both concepts and approaches which transfer. Of course, for Be this starts even earlier than that, though. Bevett was targeted at primary, but let's not forget the foundations of what we do in the early years foundation stage strategy. You have in development matters these characteristics of effective learning that a child, before they leave reception, should be creating and thinking critically, should be thinking of ideas, finding ways to solve problems, finding new ways to do things, 
making links, noticing patterns, making predictions, testing their ideas, developing ideas of grouping, sequence, cause, and effect. Simon, would you like your colleagues to be doing this at Microsoft Research? <laughs> David, your students at Harvard? Yeah, I think so. Everything which we learnt about computational thinking starts with these foundations in kindergarten, in nursery, in reception. And good practice there should carry on through. What is good practice there? What does it look like? Children solving big problems, working collaboratively. Children looking at objects and dividing them into classes. Okay, we maybe think of it of a different way round in some coding, but they're looking at the properties of these objects. You have children working collaboratively to solve difficult problems. I do worry, by the way, about the gender split in this bottom left photograph. Do you notice how the boys are doing the manual work whilst the girls take on a supervisory or managerial <laughs> role? Okay. And then in this one here, we have practitioners with triosaurs and thinkosaurs and explorosaurs. And okay, we can't really use those labels and those soft toys with our sixth form students, but I think the ideas are ones which should carry on. For Barefoot and elsewhere, we've looked at computational thinking across the curriculum. Jane has a wonderful look at phonics as a set of rules. What's the algorithm for the phoneme-grapheme correspondence? What are the rules which tell you how to write down the or sound? When you're working with a classification key over in science, this is a binary tree. We introduce these ideas probably beyond computing before we bring them into computing. Mmm, pizza. We look at recipes. We look at recipes for jam sandwiches, and of course the importance of evaluation when it comes to computational thinking. We have children building things, making things, learning about the world they live in, and let's put on a musical. The amount of computational thinking that's involved in putting on a school play is immense. Okay, so lots of applications for this that we call computational thinking across the curriculum. What, though, about the coding? Is that something which we can take outside of the domain of our subject? into other subjects. Phil uses the phrase computational doing, and I think he's right to do so. Jeanette Wing, when she was talking about computational thinking 2010, says it's the thought process involved in formulating problems and solutions so that the solutions can be represented in a form that can be effectively carried out by an information processing agent. Okay, she's including human beings as information processing agents, but you know, you all have another information processing agent with you in the room today, don't you? That the computational thinking does seem, this may be heresy, to make sense when we then go on and write some programs. Thinking about an algorithm and then implementing that algorithm as code makes it much more fun, makes it much more exciting, makes it much more real, makes it something which we can test. Phil tells the story of having children really excited coming into school, showing him the programs that they've written and can't recall the child being quite so excited about the flow chart that they've produced. It's odd, isn't it? You know, or pseudo, pseudocode, I'm sure we'll do it. But, you know. Okay, so the computational doing matters as well. And in Barefoot, we recognised this, and in Barefoot, we had lots of examples where we could take an idea from the rest of the curriculum and hang a computer programming unit around that. So I can't quite remember what the fish tank thing was. Jane will be able to remind me. Writing numbers by programming a B-bot to do that. Creating an animation of the Viking invasion, um, which was, I think, Bill's inspirational idea for this. I was doing a presentation to a group of Danish computer science teachers and was talking to them about what we'd done and then realised that I can't use the Viking invasion example with that audience. <laughs> there we've got the sort of the water cycle as an illustration of repetition. But these are very much ideas from elsewhere to motivate some learning in computing. There's another way round to this as well. And I think Papert got this right back in 1980. He saw how children who'd learned to program computers could use those models to think about thinking, to learn about learning, and to extend their powers as psychologists and epistemologists. He tells a really good story about that. This idea of learning to program then empowers you to think about problems, to understand systems differently. This is another take on computational thinking. This is getting to those things which we label as computational thinking through the experience of writing some code. I may be wrong, but I think some of your pupils are now getting to the point where they're quite good at writing code. Well done, if so. If not, then, you know, it's time to catch up. But if we've got to the point now where they're actually quite good at writing code in whatever language you happen to be using, are we now at the point where they can start taking those coding skills and start applying those to problems in other 
domains to develop their understanding of learning in other subject areas. <clears throat> the one slide summary, folks. Look for ways that your pupils can apply their coding skills and their computer science knowledge to solve problems and to develop understanding in other subjects that they're studying. Too ambitious? About time? It's going to vary from child to child, from school to school. OK, how are we doing for time? Let's think of some examples of this, OK? Um, it's fair to say the examples on the following slides are very selective. I've picked like one for each subject. There are many, many, many other examples, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this after this lecture. Also, the programs that I'm using to illustrate this are toy things. This is not developing sophisticated software engineering projects. This is a simple way of exploring an idea from the target domain, with possibly the exception of the English work that I was going to show you. Anybody using Blender? Blender is just fabulous. It's a scripted 3D animation package. This is another medium for a child's creative e expression. This is put together by a group of four sixth formers working together across, uh, across the internet to produce a digital animation using this 3D tool called Blender. And to as an entry for the CS, for the Animation 16 competition. Sorry about that. <laughs> Isn't that gorgeous work, though? Yeah? Oops. So gorgeous, we don't, don't quite need to say it again. But is that developing their learning in English? I would say so. As a medium for creative expression, there's more to English than simply writing things on paper. I think that's a lovely example of that. What about in maths? So many examples to choose from in maths. We have all of that there in the curriculum about the importance of learning fractions, which I'm sure Conrad Wolfram would acknowledge as something which is very, very hard to get a computer to do. Most of the software which we have doesn't do fractions. OK, Mathematica does, Wolfram Language does, but a lot of programs that we might use you know, won't cope if you say what's three quarters plus a third, and yet we expect a child to be able to answer that sort of question. So why not write some code to do that, or better still, get the child to write some code to do that. So with a little bit of luck, I can step out of the presentation mode view, and we can have a look at this. OK, so in order to do that, we need to um, create a function which works out the highest common factor of a pair of numbers. This uses Euclid's algorithm, the oldest recorded algorithm. Euclid was looking at this in the context of length. And we can give it some numbers to work out the highest common factor of, and it says, yes, the highest common factor of 24 and 16 is indeed 8. What about 24 and 106, 240 and 165? And the highest common factor of that is 15. Once you've created that little helper function, you can go off and create your class of fractions and create methods on that class which do class which do printing those fractions, which do adding fractions together, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing fractions. If you're looking for a motivating context for object-oriented programming in Python as this is, then implementing a system for fractions arithmetic could be one of those. If you want to see whether a child understands the algorithm for fractions arithmetic, why not get them writing some code to get a machine to do that for them. So we can give it a fraction. Two thirds plus a quarter is indeed 11 twelfths. Let's just prove that this is a live demo. What about two thirds plus three quarters? 17 twelfths. Two thirds take away. Oh, let's do a multiplication then times three quarters. And that apparently is a half, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so you know, why not? Or get your pupils to start thinking about how they can take those ideas and apply them elsewhere. What about science? So many, again, examples in science. Who here is familiar with Conway's life? Keep your hand up if you've tried coding it. If you've tried coding it in Python. 
Okay, well done, sir. Okay, I'm curious about how you went about that. It's not a difficult thing to do, but it's worth doing because of the insights into this notion of artificial life, into the properties of life, for very, very simple rules. It's a rule-based algorithm. Live cell with fewer than two living neighbours dies. Live cell with two or three living neighbours lives on. Live cell with more than three neighbours dies out because of competition for limited resources. Dead cell with three live neighbours becomes alive at the next stage. You can implement that as a model in Python relatively easily. Here we go here. So we import the NumPy library, which lets you do arrays in Python. Those of you who are wanting to teach arrays in Python, please note. We can set up an example of that here. So let's just have, I don't know, 60% or so of 100 grid. So they're marked true if they're alive, false if they're not. We can then use our model for this artificial life, Conway's life, and apply that one ge generation at a time. And then you see how that's evolved from one generation through to the next. Yes, it has. Okay, we now wave our hands and say, okay, don't worry too much about all of this code. This is somebody else's programming, which just implements a nice animation and GUI for that. And then we can see what this looks like. Okay, so there is the example which we had in the next step there, where it's true on that picture. It's colored in black on that one. So that's our first generation. We can step through one generation at a time. We can run those rules uh, repetitively and see what happens over 100 generations. And there we eventually have a stable population in those eight cells that are shaded on the screen there. We can design things in this environment. We can create life and see how that will evolve according to those rules. And famously in Conway's life, you have this little pattern of nine bits here, which again we can get to see. And it looks like that when we put it onto a 20 by 20 grid. And let's see what that does over time. Isn't that gorgeous? I could watch it all day, but we're going to run out of time if I do. Okay, so there's an example from science. What about art and design? Lots and lots of opportunities for computational art, for generative art. And my favorite of these, I think, had to be the fractal tree. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So what you have here is recursion through turtle graphics. We say a tree is made up of... Well, we go up a bit, we turn left a bit, we draw another smaller tree, we come back where we were, we turn right a bit, we draw another smaller tree, we go back to where we started. Always leave things as you found them, okay? And then we keep doing that until the tree gets so small that we cease caring about it. We run this in turbo mode because life and the presentation time is too short, and let's see what it produces there. Okay, so we get that. And we can tweak these numbers. We can change these numbers and see how that changes the tree. And is that beautiful? How do you decide if it's beautiful? What, what artistic judgment are you bringing to bear on this? And how come such a small bit of, bit of code looks such a good representation of nature? What insights does that bring with it? OK, what else have we got? We have design and technology. And this is written into the document. You've got the lovely thing from Royal Academy of Engineering about the links between design and technology and computing there to take away in your goodie bag. Uh, last Friday, I was at uh, Haberdasher's Asks Boys School, a school with more apostrophes in its name than any other school in the country, I think, yes? Okay. And they launched their microbit by give it, not just giving the microbit to the child, but creating a whole day of problem-solving activities around that. You'll have to forgive their theme tune.
It was a fabulous day, it really was. Uh, Ian Phillips in the room? Oh, okay. Uh, there he is. Yes, talk to Ian if you want to know how they went about that. It was a really, really exciting day. Lots of other opportunities for um, design and technology links with computing. Foreign languages. We heard earlier about the importance of Latin in the curriculum back in the 1960s, 1970s. And of course, Alex Hope and Ian Livingston talking about coding as the new Latin. Well, perhaps we've got to the point where Latin could be the new coding. I was, really enjoyed Ben Davis' presentation where he hides the scratch blocks by applying a like Photoshop filter to it. What about coding in another language? Use the scratch language packs to swap out into their, the language that they're learning. Anybody interpreted either the Latin or the Korean version of this and tell me what this program will do? New take on code tracing if you want one. <laughs> I think you're on the right tracks there. Okay, we can run the code and see. But Salve Mundum, I'm hoping, is Latin for hello world. Somebody <laughs> <laughs> okay. Links with geography, you can do lots and lots with looking at data in a geographical information system. We can also, though, do the lovely Raspberry Pi weather station project. Who here has got a Raspberry Pi weather station in their school? Oh, well done, you. We asked for one at Roehampton. Do you know what they said? No. Okay, but at least you've got one. Are you doing anything with it yet? This is wonderful news for those who just don't want to look out of the window and see what... That's fine. <laughs> Great use of technology. <laughs> right. Okay. But we can look at the historic weather data. Keep track of that data over a long period of time and start doing some interesting analysis with this. Let me just reload the restart and clear out. But yeah, 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 yeah. That's fine. Okay. Okay, so we do a little bit of initialization. We read in a spreadsheet which I downloaded off the Met Office's website, which has historic weather station data for Heathrow going back as far as 1948. And you see all of those numbers there. Aren't they wonderful? Okay, we can have a look at what the mean, day, mean monthly maximum and mean monthly minimum temperature is. Those are those numbers. Look at the degree of precision. Wow. Uh, we can work out the standard deviation. We can get that plotted as a histogram. Now, if you've worked in Excel, no offence, Simon, doing a histogram in Excel, oh, it's not a pleasant experience. Doing a histogram here in the Pandas toolkit for Python, really, really nice, just one line of code, and there you get the spread of monthly minimum temperatures over those years. We can do a scatter plot comparing the sunshine with the minimum temperature, and surprise, surprise, sunnier months are warmer. Okay, feel free to tweet this. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we could do a certain amount of data clearing, cleaning there, so just tidying things up. We can look at uh, the first few rows of that. We can find out what the weather was like back in 2010, this month. Okay, I'm sure that's very interesting. We can find out when the cold months are. What are cold months? Well, I'm going to call those where the, the average minimum temperature was below zero for the whole month. And where, or where the number of days where there was frost is more than half of a month, more than 15. Notice the Boolean operator coming in there is searching a database, really, isn't it? And you've got all of those months. We can look at how the maximum, average monthly maximum temperature, average monthly minimum temperature has changed over time. And there you get some charts. Okay, I was expecting more of a reaction there. <laughs> right, okay. Can you tell, notice, notice firstly that there's like a 12-month periodicity to this. Temperatures seem to go in a 12-monthly cycle. Who'd have thought it? Can you tell from looking at the chart whether there is any truth in this global, root, global warming thing or not? What could we do? Well, we could take a, an average. Let's look at maybe the past five years average temperatures and do a rolling average of that and see what that looks like on a plot. And when you see it like that, Average temperature over the previous five years, 60 months. And slight. Yeah, but it's a rolling average. So what I'm, the data that's plotted there is the average of the previous 60 months. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's smoothing the periodicity out from this graph. And you do seem to see some sort of trend line. Using our computer science, using our coding skills to learn something in another subject's domain, which is kind of the point I was trying to make here. Okay, you have in the history curriculum the opportunity to track one particular idea over a long period of time at both Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 3. 
What about the history of communication? What about the history of cryptography? Link to history. Take them on the trip to Bletchley Park, Bletchley uh, National Museum of Computing. Absolutely fab places. But also, why not get them writing some cryptography code? So what have we got here? We've got a number of little routines here. Let's just load all of those in. We've got something which encodes a message by just moving it along the alphabet or using a ciphertext alphabet which decodes it. We've got a thing which sets up a Caesar shift cipher, which is what they were using like 2,000 years ago for cryptography, which is just moving things along, along the alphabet a certain number of places. And then we have a much more sophisticated cipher, the substitution cipher, where we swap a letter for another letter of the alphabet according to some rules. So Caesar cipher with a one shift, A becomes B, B becomes C, Substitution number 123 using the random number seeds would be that one. Let's encode hello world and we get that, which looks entirely impregnable as a code. Absolute gibberish until you realize that each of those letters has just been shifted along one. We can take that with this entirely random substitution cipher and do the same sort of thing. And that looks an awful lot harder to code until you spot that all of the L's are coded exactly the same way, until you recognize that E comes up a lot in the English language, and then we can decode that. So where do you go from there? What's a better cipher than either of those two? Well, there's this thing called the Viginaire cipher, which takes a keyword and does a Caesar shift cipher according to the letter of the keyword. And if you take a long keyword, you lose all of the periodicity from that. So you can try that as code as well. So take hello world and encode it using the this keyword. Oops, didn't initialize the functions. Do that again. And you get that out of it. Let's decode that using the same keyword. And we get hello world back if we got the wrong keyword. If rather than this, we thought it was that then we don't get the keyword back. Interestingly, you could probably guess it from the number of letters that we did get right. So with a keyword of four, not a particularly secure system. So lots and lots of opportunities for children to explore, children to experiment with cryptography and its history. Music, of course. Now, there are a number of people in the room who think it's really good to be able to understand code, to make logical reasoning, use logical reasoning to predict what a program will do. If I type that into Raspberry Pi, what tune will I get? <laughs> Jingle bells. I like that. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry? Very good. Thank you very much, Simon. There's one person able to do code comprehension here. We had trouble making the sound work earlier. Okay. No, I'm not going to be able to play it to you, and no comment on Brexit views is implied by this. Okay. What about P? Can you use code in P? Yeah, lots of ways. I'm wearing something which keeps track of my fitness at the moment. But you can also use the Kinect as a sensor plugged into Scratch and get children writing programs which they have to dance in front of the and computer to use. Recorded in Scratch, as you can see, in full screen mode and our um, presentation mode. And the Scratch cat here has uh, gotten a new body and the joints have been controlled by me, as you can see. Do you not think that's fabulous? <laughs> Wouldn't that be great fun? Simon has walked to the front of the room, which suggests I have rather outstayed my welcome here. Right, quickly, PHSE and citizenship. No code for this one. But it's worth getting your pupils to think through some of the issues which result from how code is used. For instance, if British Library asked them what did they want for the future of the web. This was a year ago, 2015, anniversary of the Magna Carta. Look at the things which young people said and people voted on. Item two, freedom of speech. Item three, free from government censors in all country. Item four, not allow any kind of government censorship. Um, item six, be free from censorship and mass surveillance. The list goes on. There seems to be a theme emerging from their responses to this question. What do their insights into programming, into computer science, say about that? And finally, RE. Well, we have a whole huge number of ethical issues which are going to be on your pupils' horizons, I suspect. What happens when the machine passes the Turing test? I think the machine did pass the Turing test, but just by impersonating somebody who didn't speak English very well and was a teenager and obsessed about particular things, I may be getting it wrong. But we'll get to the point where, the where we have a conversation and we can't tell whether the thing responding on Twitter or the thing responding on the phone is a person or a machine. What happens then when that machine says, I'm conscious, I'm self-aware? I'm saying I'm conscious. Does that mean I am? 
know, what are the ethical implications for that? And getting your young people to think through that is important for their future. I want to leave you with a question. How many of these ideas or other ideas like these would work with your pupils in your context, in your school, with your colleagues? I think it may be easier in primary because we often have the same person teaching them for computing as for foreign languages, as for maths, as for science. The opportunity to make the links in primary are easier, but they get really good at coding when they get up to secondary. And what are the opportunities then for exploiting those skills inside other subject domains? Doesn't look as though I've got time for questions. Okay, right. Thank <laughs> you.